Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jacob Schreiber. I'm a fourth year graduate student at the University of Washington, where I study, uh, well, I'm a PhD student in computer science, and I study genome science problems. So essentially, I'm studying the intersection between biology and, deep, uh, and data science buzzwords. I'm here to talk about Rambutan, which is a project that I've been working on uh, for the last a uh, few years, and essentially what I'm going to do in this talk is because this is a fairly specialized talk talking about the three-dimensional structure of the genome, I'm first going to uh, describe the background behind what's going on in the model. And then I was inspired yesterday by Jim's live coding demo for Dask, and so we're going to do some live coding just to show how simple it is to use. It's a fairly simple API. And then I'm going to validate the model uh, using both accuracy metrics and various biological phenomena. So uh, a few years ago, the government realized that data on the three-dimensional structure of the genome was incredibly important. A lot of bioinformatics tasks actually try to infer the structure of the genome in order to make better predictions, and then uh, as a, but weren't able to uh, record it directly. For example, with gene expression, it was originally thought that genes were regulated by regulatory elements that were close by on the sequence of DNA. And that's kind of true, but what's even more true is that genes are regulated by regulatory elements that are nearby in the three-dimensional structure of the genome. And since no matter how you, if you imagine the genome is basically beads on a string, which it's not, no matter how you toss this, these beads up in the air, beads that are literally next to each other on the taut string will be next to each other on the three-dimensional structure, which is why we originally thought it was close to the, um, it was close by in the sequence. In addition, if you look at origins of replication, they seem like they're kind of scattered randomly across the human genome with very little uh, understanding as to why that is the case. But if you fold up the genome into its three-dimensional structure, you see that very easily what's happening is that you start replication at one end of the three-dimensional structure and you end replication at the other end. And all of these origins of replication are on the face of the genome in one of the directions. So, uh, the NIH started the 4D Nucleome Initiative to study not just the three-dimensional structure of the genome, but how this three-dimensional structure changes over the course of the cell cycle. The University of Washington is one of the four campuses that's involved, and they hold the uh, Data Analysis Center, which I'm a part of. So the way that we collect data on the three-dimensional structure of the genome is one of the ways is through an experimental technique called Hi-C. This is basically a high-throughput sequencing-based technique that collects 3D structure about um, the entire genome as opposed to asking specific questions like fish might. The way that this works is that you take your DNA, you flood it with formaldehyde. This causes cross-linking to happen between proteins that are on, already on the DNA strand. Um, the proteins here are these kind of blobby things there. Then you randomly cut the genome using a restriction enzyme so that these fragments that are now bound by the proteins are floating around. You label the ends with biotin, these little purple markers there. You then ligate it so that it's a circle, so that now you have regions of the genome that previously were not in contact. In contact. You can shear off the, uh, you can shear off the, um, proteins, and now you've conveniently had this biotin mark right at the transition from one region to the next. If you do uh, paradigm sequencing, then your read will start on one end from one region in the genome, and it'll start on the other end from another region in the genome. When you do that sequencing, you can then identify that region uh, cyan, in this case, is in contact with region uh, orins. After doing this and getting a whole bunch of sequencing done, you end up with a contact map that looks like this. Each pixel doesn't correspond to one nucleotide. That would be far too fine-grained. In this picture, each pixel corresponds to 100, uh, 100 KB. So how many times is this 100 KB fragment in contact with this other 100 KB fragment? This coarse-grained uh, information gives you a, uh, this, this coarse-grained information can tell you a lot about the genome. For example, you, you can notice that there seems like there's this box up here where there's a lot more contacts within the box and without the box. And so you can see that that region is kind of folded in itself even more. But even inside that box, you can see that there are even like these sub-boxes here, and these are called topologically associating domains, regions where all the genes and activity are highly correlated with each other. Though the most, the, the, the most apparent phenomena is that most of the contacts occur along this diagonal. This is 
uh, and this makes sense because like I said at the beginning, that things that are literally next to each other on the sequence are going to be in contact with each other far more than um, anywhere else. So this is what uh, the data comes in, the typically five columns where you talk about, the, where you include the chromosome, the fragment, mid, uh, and then the number of contacts. And one of the things that you can do with this is you can create three-dimensional structure, uh, uh, three-dimensional toy examples from this. So this is the yeast genome, and one of the things you can immediately see just by visualizing the high C contact map is not only that there's this big old hole right in the middle of the genome, but that there's this hinge region that kind of falls off the side of the genome. That's something that took biologists years of sophisticated experiments to get at, but if you just run a high C experiment, you get it immediately. So one of the problems with this is that you would imagine that the way you would identify regions that are in contact with each other that you know, are significant is you just look at the regions ordered by the number of times that they're in contact. Unfortunately, this fails immediately because the regions that are in contact with the most are the ones that are on the diagonal. So you need to account for this genomic distance effect, essentially that there's an exponential number of um, contacts that fall within the diagonal that you see here just, uh, just through physics and you, want to, you have to get rid of that. So this is called the random looping phenomena, and it's one of the biases that was tried to be accounted for in this program called fit High c which is previous work done in my lab. I suppose my advisor's lab, I'm not yet that advanced. <laughs> so what, what it does is it stratifies these contacts by genomic distance, and on the x-axis you have genomic distance between the two loci, and on the y-axis you have the number of times that they're in contact. And what you see here is this, uh, this obvious immediate exponential drop off, that as you increase genomic distance, the number of times they're in contact decreases. But um, there are these red points that seem like they have more contacts than just the baseline. So the way that fit see works is that you start off and you fit a spline, this green spline here, that, uh, to all of the data. Then you calculate the outliers to that spline and you remove them. Then you refit the red spline to the remaining data. This is a technique that was borrowed from drug discovery. Using this fit spline, you can now assign both P and Q values to each one of the points. And so the points that are statistically significant, the ones that are most likely to have biological value, are not the ones that are in contact the most, but the ones that are most statistically significant, uh, the most statistically significant with respect to the spline. You can see that like this point here has a lot of contacts given its genomic distance, but it doesn't have a lot of contacts overall if you just look at the y-axis. This is a way of trying to identify the biologically important contacts as opposed to the ones that are simply in contact the most. So after you process this, you run fit high c you end up with the same map as before, except you have p values and q values now added, uh, now added to the contact map. So. You can imagine that then you're done. Just run high C experiments on everything and then run fit high C and you can identify all the contacts. We want to bypass that directly. We want to say, can we predict statistically significant contacts directly without the need to run a high C experiment, without the need to run fit high C? And so presumably if we wanted to do that, we would take in some informative, we would be taking in these two regions and we'd be trying to predict whether or not they're statistically significantly in contact, not the number of contacts that they engage in in a fit high experiment. So why bother even trying to do this? And there are two reasons. The first is that high experiments are incredibly expensive. They increase in expense quadratically with the resolution, which makes sense because you're trying to predict a square contact map. So most contact maps right now are at the 40 or 100 KB resolution. We want to do this at the 1 KB resolution because 1 KB is around the size of a gene or like a functional element in the genome. Only one contact map has been done at one kilobase resolution because it requires so much time and so much money in order to do. The second is that if you can create a model that can accurately predict statistically significant contacts, you can imagine that it would reveal the genetic basis of 3D structure. It would be able to connect sequence and some other elements to the ultimate 3D structure. And since structure differs based on cell type, presumably we can identify what the cell type specific components of structure are. 
So if you wanted to build our classifier, traditionally we would try to take in some informative, region, uh, informative features about region one, informative features about region two, and build our estimator directly on that. The problem is that we don't have any informative features yet. We know kind of that there are some motifs like CTCF that seem like they indicate that there's going to be a connection. But other than a few motifs, we don't really know anything that would be really important. But we do know that DNA sequence roughly is going to be important. That encodes all the motifs like CTCF or GC bias or other things that we would want our classifier to take into account. The problem is that DNA sequence is the same in every cell type and we know that structure differs in each cell type. So we can't only use DNA sequence in our classifier. So we chose to also use DNA sensitivity. This is a measurement of basically how available is this nucleotide to the outside world. And you would imagine that nucleotides that are more available to the outside world are more likely to engage in a contact than those that are kind of tightly wound around their histone marks. At this point, you might ask, why don't we use a whole, bunch, a whole lexicon of various epigenetic information? And we may believe that that would in, uh, improve our classifier. But DNA has been run already for 448 human cell types and is very cheap in order to do for other cell types. If it costs us as much to run the experiments to get the input data for a model as to just get the high c experiment directly, there's no point in using our model because the high c data is going to be always more valuable. So we only use DNAs in order to reduce the cost of using our, mo our model. Sorry. So we're basically now left with a problem where we have a whole bunch of unstructured data. There are around 30 million, uh, 33 million regions of interest in just chromosome 21 alone. So neural networks are really good when you have raw structured data and data is plentiful. And also you don't want to have to think about anything. So uh, for the uninitiated, the rough way that neural networks work are that they have layers, they have layers that essentially do processing on the inputs and eventually they make a classification based off of this higher level abstraction that they've been able to learn. A uh, common area is image processing, where what you do is you run this convolution, which is basically a square like pattern that you run across the, uh, the image, identifying where this pattern is present. So you might have a pattern on the first layer that's just like a line going in this direction, then you might have a line that goes in this direction. And over layers of processing, you learn uh, bigger things like a teacup or an, a bird. In, um, in our analyses, we have kind of the same thing. We have patterns that we'd like to identify in the sequence. These are called motifs. And so we can use the exact same uh, methods. We can le learn convolutions directly on the DNA that pick up patterns that we think might be important, motifs. So um, we prepare our data by bit encoding it so that it kind of looks like an image because you can't feed a letter into a neural network. Uh, so basically, we have all the positions on one axis, and then whether or not it's an A or a C or a G or a T for nucleotide sequence. For DNA signal, uh, we use an encode, a bit encoding where we basically just try to like, we try to just like fill in the, the lines here where you know, there's a negative value, so we fill in to zero, and then here we fill in to zero from where it is, and we get a binarization that looks roughly like that. There's a more complex reason why we do that, but I don't think I have time to go into it right now. And what we get is a neural network that looks like this. At first, it looks very complicated, but the idea is that we take in the DNA and the, the DNA from two regions of the genome, we process the DNA in order to identify motifs that are relevant. We process the DNA to identify motifs that are relevant. And then we combine them together to learn motifs of both DNA and DNA that are relevant. Uh, we then combine that with the genomic distance, which we have to take into account given how strong the effect is. Uh, we do some more processing here, which is kind of like learning the regulatory code. And then we predict whether or not this is a statistically significant contact. So. Um, the big question is, does any of this work? And this clicker doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so the answer is basically, yes, it does seem like it works. Uh, so what we have here is that uh, the cyan line here is the Rambutan model, uh, ROC. And then we have using the genomic distance effect only. And at first, it may not seem like we're doing significantly better than the genomic distance effect, but there are two things to keep in mind. The first is that given how many interactions we're dealing with, since this is just on chromosome 21, uh, we, we are now correctly classifying 5 million more samples than, we, than just using genomic distance effect alone. 
The second is that using genomic distance effect alone isn't going to give us any biological information. It's not going to allow us to reconstruct biological phenomena like Rambutan can, and I'll show you in a little bit. The third is actually that the genomic distance effect is so strong that despite having groups across the nation working on this problem for several years, it, very few of them have been able to do better than the genomic distance effect. So, um, so that's important. And on the right-hand side, we have the persistent recall curve, where it seems like we're doing significantly better than the genomic distance effect, which is important since this is a very imbalanced problem. So before I go further into this, I'm just going to do a quick live coding demo and show you how to use the Van Buden packet, because I have, I've packaged the code, and it's available for everyone to use with the pre-trained model, or you can train your own models if you'd like. So all you have to do is import the model from the package and spell the package name correctly. Uh, it takes a little bit to load because I use a lot of Cython code in what I'm doing in order to make this fast. Make it bigger? I suppose. <laughs> Control plus. I don't think that works on this. Is this good enough? No? Okay. All right, I don't know how to make this bigger, so. It's going to be like three lines, and I'll read out what's happening here. Just speak louder. Okay. Is this closer here? Is this better? Okay. So the first thing that you can do, the first thing you have to do is just load up the model. And you have to specify which model parameters you're using. Um, in this case, I call everything Rambutan, so just that. And then the iteration, the number of epochs used to train, um, 25. Basically. I, have a, I provide a model that was trained for 25 epochs, and it's called Rambutan. And so you have to pass that in. But if you want to train your own thing, you can call it whatever you want and train it for however many epochs you'd like. So then you can either just pass in a faster file for your DNA. It has to be done on a, a chromosome, one chromosome at a time. So you can either just pass in the faster file for the chromosome, and your DNA's file is a bed graph file. Um, And it'll start converting the FASTA to the one hot encoding and the bed graph to the encoding. And it takes a little bit of time because it has to do all of these things. And then it'll start to predict. Alternatively, I don't want to wait this long. So what I can do is I can directly load up the encoding. And I provide tools to allow you to do the encoding yourself so that you don't have to constantly wait for it to convert the FASTA if you don't like. So all I do is I just load up using NumPy, numpy.load, the one hot encoded file. Yeah, it's probably in port NumPy. And then you can see that uh, it's millions and millions long, and then there are four line, uh, four rows, uh, because it's encoding using four possibilities. Um, and then I load up the one hot encoded DNAs for GM12878 which is the cell type that the model was trained on. And you see that it has the same shape, except that it's now eight, uh, eight columns instead of uh, four. Then you can also load up the regions instead of automatically extracting them. I have five minutes. OK. So this isn't going to finish in five minutes. So then I do model.predict. Uh, seek DNAs, regions, and then you specify your context. And it, since it's a deep neural network, uh, you specify the number of GPUs you want to use, essentially. And this is a big data problem, so you basically have to be using GPUs in order to have this finish at all. That I, I, can, I can start this now, and it takes around an hour for this to finish for chromosome 21. So we're, at this point, we're just going to watch it finish for the next hour. Uh, just kidding. So. Uh, it's loading up all the model on the various GPUs, and we'll check in on that in a little bit. Hopefully it doesn't crash. So to speed through all of the um, validation, uh, the idea, the problem is that we want to be able to validate our model across cell types, but we only have a 1 KB resolution map for GM12878. So 
what we have to do is you have to downsample up for Dixons from one kilobase resolution to five kilobase resolution. And um, I don't exactly have time to go into exactly what's going on here, but essentially what you have is that you have the Rambutan predictions in the solid line, you have the, the dashed line, the, the dotted line being genomic distance, you have the dashed line being using gm 12878 contact map alone. We have to do better than that because why bother, bother building a generalizable model on gm 12878 if the contact map alone is a better predictor? Uh, seems like we do better than every cell type except for NHEK, which is a constant outlier, not just among these analyses, but across multiple labs that are involved in this project, and we don't really know why. So then uh, we calculate insulation score, which is basically a measurement of local uh, connectivity. And what you can see here is that they've turned this, they, they've turned this contact map sideways, and they basically take a square, they sum up the number of contacts in that square, and they run it all the way down. And what you see is that uh, local minima in this score correspond to TAD boundaries, topologically associated domain boundaries. And so you can call TADs that way, but you get now a continuous measurement as opposed to a binary classification of TADs, so it could be more informative. And what we have here is that we compare the insulation score derived from Rambutan predictions to the Rambutan, uh, in Cyan to the score derived from high C maps in Magenta with just DNA sensitivity in the background in red. And the correlation is incredibly high across all cell types except for NHEK. So it seems like we're doing a really good job at recreating insulation score. Uh, this insulation score, in addition to being used for TADs, also correlates not it also correlates with histone modifications. It correlates positively with histone modifications that are used in gene regulation and generally enriched to TAD boundaries, and it correlates negatively with histone modifications that are constitutively repressed, which you would expect. Also, it seems like it, since DNA is the input, we want to control against just doing as well as DNA when correlated with a histone mod, and you can see that the prediction from Rambut the insulation score from Rambutan connects more strongly with the insulation score from high C than just using DNA alone, indicating that we are learning a structural element. Uh, we also saw that insulation score is connected to replication timing, so Rambutan can be used to predict uh, replica replication timing for novel cell types. Uh, we saw that the um, Rambutan predictions can link synchronously replicating regions, basically regions that, are, that Rambutan thinks are highly likely to be connected or more uh, also replicate together. This is a phenomenon that was discovered in the original fit high c paper, and you can see that uh, Rambutan is basically mirroring fit high c as you would hope. Um, going to skip this slide. Then we apply the model to 53 cell types from the roadmap project, and we can see that the structure seems like it connects basically with cellular function. Uh, I wouldn't look too deeply into this because this is a map created by TSNE, and you know the story behind TSNE, run it once, get a story, run it again, get a different story. So um, don't look too deeply into the exact connections here other than the fact that there seems like there's a general connection to back up the other evidence that I presented in this presentation. But you can see basically like immune cells seem like they're down here, digestive cells are around here, epithelial cells are around here. Cancer cells don't cluster anywhere because they shouldn't. They are modifications of cell types, but um, yeah, so uh, all the code is available on my GitHub, and you can all use it publicly. Uh, the biological validation notebook here recreates all of the figures in the paper, which is currently under revisions at bioinformatics. Uh, take a look at it. Uh, let me know. All the documentation and API reference for all the methods and things provided are available on Read the Docs. And I'd like to thank my advisors for putting up with me and the eScience Institute for uh, funding my travel so that I can gratuitously self-promote at conferences like this. And lastly, let's check back in on the code, and you can see that now it's predicting samples, but ultimately it has to predict 33 million samples for chromosome 21, so it's going to take a long time. Uh, feel free to open issues, qu give me uh, quest uh, raise questions, email me, anything. So. so we have time for a couple of questions. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so in the genome, it's the, the self-assembly, the three-dimensional assembly of the genome, some of it's functional, some of it's by chance, and some of it's probably due to specializations of cell state or metabolism or whatever. So if you take the same genome or similar genomes in over differentiated states, 
Do you find a core set of associations? I realize it's kind of a basic question about the technique. Yeah, so if you take any two cell types, there's around 50% overlap in the structure of the um, in the structure of the genome, and many of these correspond to genes that are vital for life, whereas uh, the things that are not included do include just random elements of the genome that don't have a real functional element, as well as specific promoters and regulatory elements, which is pretty interesting. So do you filter for that to increase the quality of signal before you begin the model? No, no, I don't do that. No. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that reminds me of a talk I attended like half a year ago. They did something similar for protein folding. Mm -hmm. Like they uh, also used a convolutional neural net. I think they used a the hidden Markov state model to, for the different states. And then related to that, I recently saw a paper where they simulated a whole cell. And for the DNA uh, or genome, the, they used like beads every so and so many kilobytes. And I was wondering if your model, because I think it's much faster than any, um, let's say, model academic simulation. Uh, used for, let's say, monitoring the, because the genome is kind of um, not a snapshot, it's kind of also right. moving, and if you think that could also be uh, useful for like um, simulations or changes over time and uh, things like that. I would have to, um, the model as it is right now only takes in DNA and DNA, so it doesn't allow for any, unless DNA is changing, then it's not going to produce different results. Um, of course, I think the model is useful in all situations because I built it. Uh, it's not going to be useful for predicting proteins because right now it's predicting very coarse grain things and the, the genome folding is very different from protein folding. No, but uh, right now, for example, for the cell simulation, they uh, do the simulation uh, separately for DNA, for protein, right. so, and also then um, I can imagine it could be a useful thing to predict the initial structure of the genome before they run any simulations, like primer or starting point. It could be. We should talk after this. We should talk after this. Any other questions? Yeah, you, last question. Can you also uh, predict the chromosomal uh, context? Uh, right now we can't okay. because we, we, focus, we need genomic distance. But we found that most of the chromosomes seem like they fold into glo uh, blobs, essentially. Yeah. So um, Just it, asking about like, stuff like the, the, the CLEOS, right, which is you know, which the region you're kind of known for, so they're able to validate. Right. Uh, yeah, we don't predict, uh, we don't predict between chromosomes. Thank you.